Uh, hello, uh, this is the um, pre-recorded version of the talk. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for the opportunity to present this uh, work. Um, and secondly, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being in the audience. Um, the title of the talk is uh, Using Local Weak Limit Techniques to Study Large Sparse Networks. So uh, what the talk's about is, um, is a modeling technique, uh, proposing a modeling technique to get approximate analytical estimates of uh, performance characteristics in large networks. And um, this technique is, is basically based on plausibility arguments. It's not really supported at the moment by theorems. And um, the talk is, um, is meant to be tutorial uh, so if you're already an expert on the underlying ideas, which is basically the uh, theory of local weak limits for sparse graphs, uh, then there's probably little in here that you would get apart from the uh, the suggestion that you know it could be used for um, building models for large networks. Uh, I've been working in this general area of um, local weak limits for some years now. And uh, my main collaborators have been uh, Justin Salles on the left. He's um, now a professor of mathematics in Paris. And uh, Payam Delgosha, who's now a professor in the computer science department at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, the work I've done with Justin and Payam has uh, lots of theorems. So um, hopefully uh, in connection with the suggestions that I'm making in this talk, they will eventually also be theorems. Um, so to, to, to sort of set the stage, let's start with some simple queuing um, model. So uh, imagine that you have a, a single server queue with a finite buffer, which can hold um, up to K packets, capital K packets. Arrivals to the queue are coming according to a Poisson process of rate lambda, and uh, the server works at rate one. So this system can be described by a continuous time Markov chain. There's a rate diagram um, shown on the right, uh, states zero through capital K. Uh, the down rate from each state is one and the up rate, uh, from, down rate from each non-zero state is one and the up rate is lambda, uh, except if uh, in the state K, capital K. So an arrival that comes to a system with a full buffer is thought of as being rejected. Uh, one can write down the stationary distribution. Uh, it's basically pi k is uh, proportional to lambda to the k, and the normalizing factor is as shown uh, right here. And um, in stationarity, basically, uh, you would have departures at rate one, except when the system is empty. So the rate of departures is one minus the stationary probability of being empty. And uh, you would have acceptances uh, at basically the rate at which external arrivals come except when you're in the state K. And of course, the rate of departures must equal the rate of acceptances. Uh, occasionally, I'll talk about the special case where capital K is one. In that case, uh, the rate of departures or rate of acceptances works out to this number here, lambda over one plus lambda. Now, uh, we're really interested in networks of queues uh, or service stations. So imagine now a simple network, let's say it's comprised of uh, three nodes. And at each node, uh, there's a server which has a finite buffer. It's on arrival process. And um, we, for simplicity, think of all the buffers as being of the same size, capital K. Each server is working at rate one. And the arrival process at each server is a independent Poisson process of rate lambda. Now, if there is no interaction between the queues, then there's nothing novel. Uh, it's basically just like what was on the previous slide. Each uh, queue uh, evolves on its own. And so you can write down a formula for the uh, per server uh, rate of acceptances. But uh, you might have um, <clears throat> the following possibility. So let's say that uh, an arrival into a full buffer, instead of getting rejected, uh, it Imagine that it can pick one of its neighboring servers at random. So in this case, each of the servers has got two neighboring servers. So uh, let's say that if this was uh, if this uh, buffer was full, an arrival there would pick one of these two servers at random. 
And if that uh, buffer, that server is not yet full, then it can get accepted to that buffer. So this is a different dynamic. You might ask yourself, well, does, does this have any benefits? Uh, it seems, of course, that it would, but it may not be immediately obvious because you're using up somebody else's space, right? So how do you know? So in any case, you can analyze the uh, corresponding continuous time Markov chain, uh, which in general would be a somewhat complicated chain. Uh, let's analyze it for the case where capital K equals one. So when capital K equals one, then at each server, you can either, it's either empty or it has one packet. Those are the only two possibilities. So you can keep track of the state of the system by just keeping track of the number of uh, the servers that have actually got packets. So now you have this Markov chain. This is a Markov chain, which is just keeping track of the number of full buffers, <clears throat> state zero, one, two, or three. So if there's one full buffer, the rate of departures is one. If it's two buffers, its rate is two. Three buffers, it's three. If the entire system is empty and then the rate of arrivals is three times lambda, that is moving to some buffer occupied. But what's interesting here is that uh, if you have say a state where just one of the buffers is full, uh, then of course at the other two buffers, you have uh, arrival rate two lambda, but if an arrival comes into that full buffer, it's gonna pick one of the other servers at random and it's gonna get accepted because those two other servers have empty buffers. So actually the up rate from one to two is three lambda and the up rate from two to three you can similarly see it's actually two lambda. It's basically lambda plus lambda over two plus lambda over two. You can work out the stationary distribution of this Markov chain also. And uh, you can work out that the per server rate of acceptance is better than that without interaction. So, which is anyway, something that you would have expected. But now here's the kind of question that we'd like to address is, suppose you've got a very complex, large network. For instance, uh, here is a, pretty large network and it has some interconnection structure. Uh, imagine that at each of these nodes, there is a, a server which has got a buffer of size capital K, it's own arrival process, uh, Poisson of rate lambda. And um, now you might ask similar kind of questions. Suppose you have a dynamic of the following sort where uh, an arrival at a full buffer can pick one of the neighboring servers at random and get accepted there if that buffer is not full. What is the per server rate of acceptance? Uh, how do you compute something like this? Well, for a very large network, of course, you can set up a huge Markov chain, but it's going to be a fairly complicated process of trying to solve that Markov chain. So what we're looking at, looking for is some uh, quick approximations that give us some insight into what to expect for the, what range of answers to expect, basically. That's kind of thing that is being proposed, being discussed in this talk. And of course, you can ask for much more interesting uh, kinds of dynamics. For instance, you could, even in this simple scenario, you could imagine uh, asking the following question. Suppose that instead of just looking at uh, the immediate neighbors, you're allowed to look at neighbors up to depth two. So you might pick one of the uh, servers at random among all the servers that are at up to depth two from you in case the buffer at which you arrive is full. You might do that at random. And then if there's room there, you might, uh, you might get accepted there. Or you could have other more interesting dynamics where you actually look at the sizes of all those buffers and join the shortest of those queues, et cetera, et cetera. So all these kinds of questions become very hard to answer uh, exactly in large and somewhat unstructured networks like this. And the basic reason is that there is, um, uh, even though the dynamic is kind of local, the overall solution is, is requires some kind of a global viewpoint. And that's illustrated here, for instance, in the look at the graph on the left and consider the node which is um, made thick. So that's basically the distinguished node. Uh, if you look at the depth one neighborhood of that node uh, in this graph on the left, it looks the same as the depth one neighborhood of the node and of the distinguished node in the graph on the right, because each of them basically has three edges going out of the distinguished node. But the graphs are very different. So uh, sort of locally from the point of view of this node, uh, similar things are happening in terms of the interaction locally, but the overall solution requires a global viewpoint. So of course people have uh, encountered this problem in many different fields and uh, any, anything having to do with the complex stochastic dynamics. And a traditional approach that has been used is something called the mean field approximation. Uh, this is an idea that comes from statistical mechanics. <clears throat> 
Uh, one of the earliest papers I know on this topic is by the famous probabilist Mark Katch uh, from 1956, who uh, uses this in the kinetic theory of gases. Um, but it's also used in many statistical mechanical kinds of models as a way of getting quick insights. <clears throat> so for instance, a very, a very well-studied uh, model for uh, ferromagnetism is the Ising model. Uh, here you have the state of, uh, basically looking at the state of a system of magnets, which can be either spin up or spin down. So the blue is spin up and the red is spin down. Uh, imagine that the uh, that you have a rectangular grid of, uh, of these uh, magnetic uh, locations, uh, say square root of n by square root of n grid. So you have a total of n such spins. And consider the following dynamic. So this is very much a uh, very good model for, um, for ferromagnetic materials and has lots of complexities and is uh, being studied to tremendous depth in many, many different contexts uh, for many, many different problems. Uh, and uh, But just imagine the following dynamics. So <clears throat> a spin is going to basically look at its neighbors and uh, if it's going to flip its spin at the rate proportional to the number of neighbors of opposite spin. So for instance, here is this blue sp uh, up spin it has got four neighbors. So you go north, south, uh, east, west. Two of those neighbors are uh, pointing down. So the rate at which this blue spin becomes red is uh, basically two times some basic unit, basic unit of rate. Whereas, for instance, um, this blue spin, this up spin, has got three neighbors that are pointing up and one neighbor pointing down. So it's going to flip only at rate one times the basic unit. So, um, so of course you can imagine there'll be two stationary situations, one in which all the spins are pointing up and one in which they're all pointing down because then they won't want to flip. And this captures the phenomenon of uh, magnetism or is considered to be a good model for capturing ferromagnetism because it, it captures this phase transition. But analyzing even this, uh, this probabilistic dynamic is kind of complicated business. So uh, people study, for instance, the following uh, very relatively crude approximation to it. So in a mean field model, a spin is uh, thought of uh, not just as looking at its neighbors, but it's just picking some other spin at random from the remaining n minus one spins and flipping to the orientation of that spin. So the general philosophy in the mean field, mean field model is to think of each entity as, uh, as interacting with the ensemble uh, rather than just with its neighbors. So you lose uh, track of basically the geometry of the interconnections, but you still somehow retain some knowledge of the dynamics. And uh, people generally think of this as being useful when, uh, you're, when you're dealing with very large networks or large grids in this case, so n is going to infinity. And in the limit, you sort of think of a spin as interacting with the, with the variable that takes values in the unit interval, which represents the probability of finding a randomly chosen spin in the up orientation, let's say. <clears throat> and, uh, and the reason this is useful is because you can write some kind of fixed point because you, uh, the spin that you're looking at is itself a member of the ensemble. So uh, intuitively somehow its probability of being up should be sort of similar to the probability of the ensemble being up. That is the chance of finding somebody up in the ensemble. So you can write a fixed point equation for that. So that's the philosophy of the mean field method. Let's look at the mean field approximation in our example. That is our example with the uh, buffers of size K. Uh, we've got a large complex network. We've got this dynamic where uh, an arrival at a full buffer gets to pick one of the neighbors at random. And if there's room in that neighbor, it gets accepted in that server. But now what we're going to do is ignore locality and convert it into some mean field kind of approximation. Of course, it's a very crude approximation, but you know you can think of it as being useful for giving you a first cut look at the overall uh, performance. So we'll assume that an arrival to a server with a full buffer actually picks one of the servers at random uh, and uh, looks for room there to get accepted. And we'll also assume that the number of servers is very large, which is an asymptotic viewpoint. So with this viewpoint, you can actually write a fixed point equation for the stationary distribution, it turns out. We'll see that in a minute. And if you're interested in the dynamics, you can also write uh, uh, an evolution equation for the occupation probabilities, the probability that uh, uh, some given server is in, a uh, buffer is in state k for each k as a function of time. Uh, say uh, you can do this, for instance, assuming that you have iid initial conditions. <clears throat> 
So how do you write these fixed point equations? So the, the stationary fixed point equation uh, can be written by writing down a what looks like a continuous time Markov chain, which represents the stationary state of uh, one of these uh, queues, one of these buffers. It looks just like the, the Markov chain I drew earlier. <clears throat> the down rate from each state is one because the server is operating at rate one. The up rate from each, uh, the down rate from each non-zero state and the up rate from each state other than the full state is uh, now replaced, is now lambda is replaced by lambda tilde. And lambda tilde is basically lambda plus lambda times the probability of being in the state capital K. It's very interesting. So the reason for this is <clears throat> somehow you're in, an, you're in an environment where the ensemble probability, probability of somebody picked at random being um, in the state capital K is pi sub K. <clears throat> so more precisely, there are about if n is very large, roughly n times pi sub k people who are uh, servers which are have got full buffers, each of them is basically picking some location at random whenever an arrival occurs to arrives at that buffer. So that's happening at, at this rate, uh, lambda times pi sub k um, times n, let's say. But it, it picks this particular individual server roughly only with probability one over n. So you're left with a net rate at which this particular server is hit. Uh, which is lambda times pi sub k, and you add it to its own intrinsic arrival rate. So you can solve this just like you would solve a continuous time Markov chain. But the main thing to note is that there is a fixed point nature to this diagram because the pi sub k is determined by solving uh, for this rate diagram, but the rates in the rate diagram themselves depend. Some of the rates depend themselves on pi sub k. So in fact, the solution uh, to pi sub k will be, uh, I mean, pi sub k will be a solution of some algebraic equation typically, which might have multiple solutions. And these multiple solutions correspond to uh, existence of multiple regimes of operation, if there are multiple solutions, which uh, basically corresponds to phase transitions. Some of you um, who are old enough will remember that uh, in the days of circuit, when people were studying circuit switch networks, there was a lot of interest in dynamic routing heuristics where if uh, you don't find circuits uh, along a, along the preferred route, you choose some alternate route. And there, in fact, uh, uh, real world systems often demonstrated this kind of uh, sudden change of phase. And these mean field models were quite useful in uh, sort of understanding why that occurs. So um, this is a fairly useful methodology, even though it's very crude. As for the nonlinear evolution equation, it's sort of a similar story. Now the rate of going up uh, depends on time. And uh, basically at time t, there is a, any given server has a probability of being in state k, which is p of x t equals k. Remember the conditions are iid, and that means that the evolution will be uh, exchangeable invariant to the permutations of the identities of the servers. So it's the same kind of logic. You know, the, uh, If you have n servers and n is very large, roughly n times P of X T equals K of them are in state K. Uh, each of them is has an arrival coming in at rate lambda and uh, they're going to pick somebody at random. And the chance of you getting picked basically is one over N times, N times lambda probability of X T equals K. So you get a standard evolution equation just like for a you would for a continuous time Markov chain, except that the up rates are now lambda hat sub T. So this is the rate at which you move, uh, uh, you know, going from k minus one to k, going from k plus one to k, and getting out of state k. And this is uh, not uh, like the traditional linear equation you would get in continuous time Markov chains because this lambda hat t itself depends on the probability that x t equals k. So it's a nonlinear evolution equation. So um, people have studied these kinds of um, things uh, in a, a fair level of abstraction. So here, for instance, is a general theorem that you can prove Suppose you have a system of uh, interacting Markov chains. Each of the chains has got the same finite state space S, let's say. There's little n such chains. Little n is going to go to infinity eventually. Every chain has got its own uh, rate rates at which it moves. So if you're in state X, you would go to state Y at the rate Q, X, Y. But there's also some interaction dynamic. So a chain which is in the state Z will pick another chain at random. And if that chain is in the state X, it will cause that chain to change its state to y. So there are some rates like this. Then you can show that you can prove this as formal theorems. I, I just stated them uh, in words, basically. So as n goes to infinity, starting from iid initial conditions, 
if you're looking at the evolution of the of the distribution of you know, the state of say the first server it evolves according to some nonlinear evolution equation where the effective rate is uh, its own intrinsic rate and then the rates that come from the interaction basically the probability of some other server being in the state z uh, in a very very large ensemble is sort of like your own probability of being in the state z and in that case uh, that other other servers might cause you to undergo the transition from x to y if they happen to pick you so this becomes the effective rate another interesting thing that happens in this context is that if you look at a fixed number of servers say say if p is 5 you pick five of the servers and you ask how they evolve they all evolve asymptot in the in the asymptotic limit basically independently according to this uh, nonlinear evolution equation uh, this phenomenon is called propagation of chaos so this is a mean field theory it's uh, got a long history in statistical mechanics many applications and it's still being actively researched uh, many people working on so called mean field games and so on uh, but my point is in this talk is basically to say that is to address some of the shortcomings of this theory or to try to address them. Uh, one of the main shortcomings, uh, even though it's a useful theory, is that uh, the local structure of the dynamics is completely thrown out of the window and replaced by this um, idea of interacting with the ensemble. And uh, uh, basically the point that uh, one is trying to make in this talk is that that's not great and we would like to find an alternative for that. So the alternative suggestion comes from this theory of uh, local weak convergence for uh, graphs. And uh, so I'd like to explain what that theory is. Again, as I said, for the experts, there's not going to be much that's new. So this theory was motivated by uh, basic observation. Uh, well, one way to motivate the theory anyway is, uh, is to make the following basic observation. So why is it that when we teach people, uh, when we teach students, um, data science or statistics, uh, or you know, when we do analysis of time series, et cetera, we use stochastic process models. So we say, oh, you know, we have the sequence of random variables, and let's say we're dealing with a stationary stochastic process, it's then the sequence of random variables is described by its uh, marginal distributions, its pairwise marginals, its triple marginals, et cetera. Well, uh, in, in, in the real world, basically all you have is some data sample. So you're seeing some sequence of observations. Let's say that the observations are drawn from some finite set. And uh, the, the reason it's okay to somehow think of this data sample as being drawn from some distribution is would be if the data sample is somehow revealing that distribution. And uh, one way to think about it, for instance, let's say that you have a data sample consisting of zeros and ones. Think of a very, very long data sample like this. So this is basically two, two times capital N plus one long, roughly more, something like that. Uh, a binary sequence. Uh, we want to think of this as, as connected somehow to some underlying prob uh, uh, probability distribution. And what that probability distribution needs to be is something that is constructed somehow empirically from this data sample or something that is consistent with what you would uh, get if you empirically looked at, say, the fraction of times you see a one or a zero in this data sample, the fraction of times that pairs look either one, one or one, zero or zero, one or zero, zero, or in this case, as in this diagram, you look at the fraction of triples that have a particular configuration. So essentially what you're doing is, so you, uh, the viewpoint is, you want to take is that the stochastic process model is justified from the data sample by thinking about the empirical distribution constructed from the data sample. So uh, in order for you to believe that a certain stochastic process model is a, is a decent model for the actual data you're dealing with, you better have some kind of convergence property of this sort, where when you take the empirical averages over the data sample, you're sort of getting the, in the limit, you're getting the distributions that you think your model is, has. Now, what you're doing when you construct this empirical distribution is you're basically picking some location at random along the data sample, and you're looking around you up to the relevant depth. So for instance, uh, one way to think about what you're doing when you're finding the empirical distribution for triples you're picking some location at random, maybe it's starting from the left up to the point that is, you know, three steps to the left here, looking to your right to depth three, and you're, you're sort of looking at that configuration and averaging those configurations. That's what you're doing when you're taking this empirical distribution. So the theory of local weak convergence of sparse graphs basically uh, adopts this viewpoint in the context of graphs, uh, or more generally what are called marked graphs. 
Uh, here is an example of a marked graph. Uh, here, uh, a graph has got eight vertices and it's got nine edges. And uh, the vertices have got two kinds of marks. Uh, they're either circles or they're marked by circles or they're marked by squares. So here, two of the vertices are marked by squares. Uh, six of them are marked by circles. The edges have got two kinds of marks. They're either blue or they're orange. Uh, here, uh, four of the uh, vertices are orange and five of them are blue. The specific graph, but I want to think of this graph as a member of some probabilistic ensemble. That is, I want to think of this graph as being drawn from some distribution on some object which plays the role of a stochastic process. And uh, the methodology for doing this is to do basically what we did in the data sequence um, context. So we are going to pick one of the vertices at random, eight vertices, so each of them is picked with probably one over eight. And we are just going to look around that vertex. We are going to imagine that we are standing at that vertex and we're looking at the structure of the graph around that vertex to different depths. So the most basic thing is to just look at depth zero. So you're just looking at that vertex itself. Or then you might go to depth one, then you might go to depth two, depth three, depth four, et cetera. And since you've picked the location that you're standing at at random, you're actually getting a probability distribution on these uh, uh, fixed depth uh, views around you. And of course, in this case of finite graph, if the depth is big enough, you sort of see the entire graph. But you see the entire graph from the point of view of the place that you're standing. So let's look at an example. So suppose you look around you to depth two. Uh, it turns out that with probably half, this is the, going to be your view of the world. With probably one fourth, this is going to be the view of the world. And with probably one fourth, this is going to be the view of the world. You can check that quite easily. So uh, if you're at one of the, if you're standing at one of these places that is marked with the with the square, there are uh, two over eight such places, namely one over four. Then if you go to depth two, you can check that this is the view of the world you'll see. Basically, you say you're standing here. You've got these three blue guys sticking out. One of the blue guys has got two blue guys sticking out. The other two blue guys connect through orange guys. Basically, that's what it looked like. Whereas if you're standing at one of these uh, circle uh, marks, uh, things marked with a circle for three of them, for six, four of them out of the six, uh, out of the total of eight, uh, it's going to look like this. And for the other two out of the total of eight, it's going to look like this. So we think about a probability distribution on rooted marked graphs of depth two, I mean, uh, of depth two from the root as being somehow like a you know, depth two marginal distribution associated to some stochastic process. That's the idea. And in this case, if you go out to sufficiently large depth, you actually get the entire graph. And uh, you can think about that as uh, also being a probability distribution on uh, rooted marked graphs of arbitrary depth. So potentially uh, count with countably infinitely many vertices in general. So uh, formally, basically, you define a space, which is a space of uh, marked rooted graphs. Uh, I wrote unlabeled here uh, to be uh, to uh, to make it clear that we are not thinking of any numbering on the on the uh, vertices. We're just thinking about the graph with unnumbered vertices. So there's no labels, but we have what we call marks. The marks are the colors and these, you know, the colors on the edges or the or the uh, mark on the vertices. But there are no specific labels like these numberings. The numberings are not in, in our view. They're just thinking of it as a graph. So if you think of the space of unlabeled marked rooted graphs, but there, so there's a particular place we are standing, some vertex that we are standing at, which is a root. And we're looking at the graph from, from the viewpoint of that root. And uh, the stochastic process, what, what plays the role of stochastic process in uh, statistics or data science or probability theory uh, or certain aspects of probability theory is basically um, going to be a probability distribution on the set of rooted graphs. Of course, to make sense of this, you need the set of rooted graphs to be, to be made into a, a decent measurable space. And the uh, thing is, you, you can actually do that. So the formal way of doing that is you first define the set, the set of all uh, rooted, marked, unlabeled graphs. Uh, formally, actually, you're looking at uh, graphs up to rooted isomorphism. So somebody gives you a graph, a rooted graph, somebody else gives you a rooted graph. It, they would be considered the same if there is a one-to-one -one mapping that preserves the roots, preserves the uh, edges. So you're looking at equivalence classes up to rooted isomorphism. We also insist that our graphs be connected because our view is that you're standing at the root and you're looking at the graph around you. Uh, if the graph is disconnected, the parts that you can't, that are not connected to the root don't exist as far as you're concerned because you can't see them. 
So we're only looking at uh, connected uh, rooted graphs. And we also insist that they be locally finite. What this means is that every vertex has got finite degree. The degree can change from vertex to vertex, but we insist that the degree of each vertex is finite. So that's a set. We have not yet got to a stage where we can do probability theory. So the way we end up doing that is we define a metric on that set. Turns out to be a metric. And uh, if you have two elements in this set, two rooted label, uh, at this point, actually, what I'm doing here is not even for label graphs. You can do it, I mean, not even for marked graphs. You can do it for marked graphs, but right now, just consider the case without marks. So if you have two elements in the set and they look the same up to depth R, the bigger R is the better. So we look at some number like one over one plus R, which becomes smaller as R becomes bigger. And we say that the distance between these two elements is one over one plus R. If R is the largest depth of a neighborhood around the root up to which they look the same. You can pick other numbers here if you like. This turns out the, to, give, to metrize this set and it actually uh, makes the set a complete separable metric space, which is the best kind of space to do probability theory in, in the current way people do probability theory. It's what's called a Polish space. So uh, what we've seen is that every fixed finite graph actually can be thought of as being giving rise to a probability distribution on this set by picking the root at random. And now we have this idea of what it means for a, a sequence of graphs to actually represent a samples from a stochastic process, so to speak. So if you have a sequence of finite graphs, uh, we would say that they converge in the sense of local weak convergence. If the corresponding probability distributions on the set G star that we create, like we did in that diagram, uh, converge in the usual sense of probability theory, that is they converge in the weak convergence sense, that is for any bounded continuous function on the set G star, the integrals uh, converge. I just did all this in this slide, in these uh, bullets for unmarked graphs, but you can do the same thing for marked graphs. Essentially, you've got to think about being, you know, being the same as marked graphs up to a given depth to define the distance. And once again, you get a complete separable metric space, et cetera. So the way you want to think about what this local weak convergence theory is doing for you, it's basically saying that you can think of a graph, of a sequence of graphs as being samples from some probability distribution on the set of rooted graphs, rooted mark graphs, if you like. Uh, if uh, for any fixed depth, as you as the graphs get bigger and bigger, the local, the empirical distribution of the local structure up to that depth, so that depth says k zero essentially uh, converges to the uh, distribution up to depth k0 in the limit. That's basically what local weak convergence of graphs is trying to capture. It works for sparse graphs, namely graphs which have a number of edges, which is on the same scale as the number of vertices. Now, uh, let's look at some examples. So one basic example in this, this is an example of an edish rennie graph. Now, an edish rennie graph actually is itself a random graph, so it may be slightly confusing. What I said earlier was just for fixed graphs. But uh, what I'm going to say basically is that um, if you have, uh, say, a sequence of realizations of edish rennie graphs as, uh, as n gets bigger and bigger, and the edish rennie graphs have to be in the sparse regime. So what this means is that uh, the probability of an edge existing is, uh, is, uh, is alpha or n, so that the expected number of edges that exist is on the scale of alpha, basically uh, alpha over n times n choose 2. Uh, so it's on the scale of n, sorry, yeah. Alpha is on the scale of, is on the same scale as the number of vertices. So consider basically a sequence of such realizations of edish rennie graphs, if you like. Uh, you can show that, uh, uh, that the local weak limit is a distribution on trees uh, where uh, you have the root and the number of children of the root is, uh, uh, ignore the colors for the moment. Here, this is uh, because I just think of the uncolored situation. Uh, so this is just to make the, diagram look better. So um, uh, the number of edges that come out of the root are basically going to uh, have uh, converge to a distribution, to a Poisson distribution with parameter alpha. And what's more, the number of children of each of these, uh, of, uh, of each of these children will be random with a distribution which is also Poisson with parameter alpha, and they're all chosen independently. And the reason for this is basically that the chance of your having in your sequence of graphs some connection between one of these children and another one of these children uh, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So the, the so the sequence of realizations of larger and larger edish any graphs in the sparse regime will converge in the local weak convergence sense to a probability distribution on rooted trees, in fact, 
which is constructed in this way uh, by using Poisson random variables. That kind of tree is called a random tree is called a Poisson Galton Watson tree. Uh, Galton and uh, Galton, uh, uh, very famous uh, geneticist. Uh, so uh, this this tree showed up in in genetic, and uh, it, it Galton Poisson Galton Watson tree basically you pick a root, you pick a pos, you start with the root, you pick a Poisson number of neighbors. And then for each neighbor, you pick another independent Poisson number of neighbors and proceed iteratively to build the random tree. Now, the Poisson, all these limits that show up in this local weak convergence theory have got a property which is very important to have some intuitive feeling for. At an intuitive level, the property that they have is basically some kind, it's a certain kind of uh, invariance to the change of the root. Because you're starting with a situation where you're picking the location that you're at, at at random. So somehow all locations should roughly be the same. Uh, actually, it's in some kind of group theoretic sense that the world should look the same from every vertex. And the formal property that captures that is called unimodularity. So for define unimodularity, you actually have to think about a set of doubly rooted graphs. So you pick two vertices and uh, you think about the graph with these two distinguished vertices. So there'll be a first vertex and a second vertex. And uh, the set that set is called G double star and you can uh, metrize it just like we did earlier by going to uh, you know, a finite depth and so on, uh, say from one of the vertices or, so you can metrize it and uh, you can now consider functions uh, bounded continuous functions on this on this complete separable metric space. So the underlying probability distribution on just singly rooted graphs would be said to be unimodular if it has the following property for every function on the set of doubly rooted graphs. Notice that even though these two integrals look the same on the left, you have O V, but here you have V O. So the intuitive idea that is uh, that that is formally captured by this requirement is that you can flip O and V, and you basically see the same situation. So uh, it takes some time to understand what this unimodularity is, but this is I, I, it's important for me to say that because all these limits will be unimodular. Uh, so the local vague limit of any sequence of finite graphs will be a unimodular probability distribution on the set G star. Now, now is a very important uh, thing I want to say because this is connected with the main purpose of this talk, which is to suggest a certain modeling approach to deal with performance analysis questions in large networks. And uh, the suggestion is connected with a way to generalize the Poisson Galton Watson tree that is well known. And it's a, it's a class of what are called unimodular Galton Watson trees, unimodular used in the same sense as on the previous slide. Uh, you can think about unimodular Galton Watson trees as standing in the same relation to Poisson Galton Watson trees as uh, renewal processes stand in relation to Poisson processes. That's a reasonable, uh, intuitive, rough intuitive way to think about what, uh, what's going to be said right now. And again, remember, we have not yet brought in the marks. We are only, we're still talking about unmarked graphs. So just raw graphs without any, you know, uh, uh, circles or, or squares or colors or whatever, no marks. So to construct a, a unimodular Galton Watson tree, and here you're uh, actually I'm constructing just a unimodular Galton Watson tree to depth one. Later on, we will even generalize that. What we'll do is we'll start with the probability distribution on non negative integers, which has a finite mean. We'll uh, construct another probability distribution, which also on non-negative integers, which sort of looks just like what you would do if you're doing renewal theory. So you scale pi i plus one by i plus one and uh, renormalize by the mean. You can check that the pi hat i add up to one. So pi hat is also a probability distribution, which is derived from pi. To construct a unimodular Galton Watson tree, you start with a root. You give it a random number of children where the number of children is distributed according to pi. But now for each child, you give it a random number of children where the children is, number of children is not distributed according to pi hat. If, you, if pi was a Poisson law, it turns out that pi hat is also a Poisson law. You can check that. So uh, the Poisson Galton Watson tree is a special case of this unimodular Galton Watson tree. And actually, many interesting sequences of graph models have unimodular Galton Watson trees as their local weak limit. This is without marks. Uh, 
uh, and, and I mean, not just unimodular ones of depth one, but a slightly more general version, which I'll shortly define. Um, but more interestingly, you can actually approximate uh, general unimodular limits by sequences of unimodular Galton Watson tree uh, distributions. So uh, in, a, in, in the same sense in which you can approximate, I mean, roughly the same sense in which you can approximate stationary probability distributions by sequence of uh, depth K Markov processes, it's sort of analogous in sense. So all this has been done uh, for um, uh, the unmarked case, but I wanted to give some intuition for um, uh, why these uh, Galton Watson trees um, uh, look the way they do. And uh, here's a specific example for, of unimodular Galton Watson tree, um, which is corresponds to the case where uh, pi of one is eta and pi of two is one minus eta for some eta between zero and one. So uh, basically the situation is that um, starting at the root, you have one edge sticking out with probability eta, or you have two edges sticking out with probability one minus eta. Now you've got to extend this tree, and for extending it, you're going to use the pi hat distribution. You can check that pi hat uh, is has these uh, has these is basically this distribution. So pi hat of zero is eta over two minus eta. Two minus eta is basically eta plus two times one minus eta. And to compute pi hat of zero, you have to look at one times pi of one divided by two minus eta, and so on. So the scenario on the left occurs probably eta, the one on the right occurs probably one minus eta. And at any given child here, you basically are not going, you will not, you, you terminate the process with this probability because zero more edges are going to be added or you'll add one more edge with this probability. So essentially what you're going to get in this special unimodular Galton Watson tree is, is some finite sequence of edges. Uh, it's going to be finite because eventually you're going to have to terminate it. Uh, either, you know, even in this scenario, going to the left and going to the right, both ends will eventually get terminated after some finite number of steps. So the graph containing the root must be aligned with a finite number of segments. And the probability that the number of segments is k can be computed to be this, very simple calculation. So this seems like a rather strange distribution, but it actually connects to some very standard things. So if you consider with tau equal to eta over two minus eta, a two-state Markov chain that looks like this. So from zero, you go to one with probability one. From one, you go to zero with probability tau, or you stay at one with probability one minus tau. So an information theorist would call this a Z-channel. That's why I use that word. You consider the discrete time renewal process whose interarrival time is the law of the excursions from state zero back to state zero in this two-state continuous time Markov chain. Um, actually, I want to think of this as a discrete time Markov chain, sorry, because it's a, renewal, a discrete time renewal process. And then consider the stationary version of this renewal process. So you, you got this renewal process and you stationarize it. Now in this stationary renewal process, I'm going to interpret a transition from zero to one as the end point of a line segment, a transition from one to one as basically an edge in the line segment and a transition one to zero as the end point of a line segment. So the sample sequence of this discrete time stationary renewal process will correspond to a, a you know, bunch of finite length uh, segments. And it turns out that the length of the stationary line segment defined by the origin has the distribution, the strange looking distribution we calculated earlier. So this kind of explains how this uni, at some level anyway, how this unimodular Galton Watson trees connect to notions of stationarity and also of you know, invariance of direction because renewal processes have that invariance of direction property in stationarity. So uh, it's a good example to think about. And uh, it also connects to palm theory because renewal theory is, I mean, the connection between stationary uh, version and the uh, original renewal process can be understood via palm theory. Palm theory is the theory of uh, in point process theory that uh, is related to what's called the renewal paradox that we often study in probability theory and so on. Okay, so now, uh, uh, to get to the punchline, so to speak, we also need to extend this notion of unimodular Galton Watson trees to marks. We've done it so far without marks. And we also want to make it more interesting because we want the basic law to be of a higher depth potentially than just depth one. So I'm going to show you some pictures that explain how this is done. And this is very important if one wants to use this modeling suggestion. And actually, I'm going to do it in a situation that is even more general than the earlier situation where uh, each vertex can carry a mark drawn from some finite set. But I think of each edge as carrying two marks. 
one mark going in one direction and the other mark going in the other direction. Here's an example. So uh, a, a graph which is marked in the way in which I'm going to uh, discuss things over the next few slides. Each edge carries two marks, one towards each of its endpoints. So for instance, here is this edge, it carries a, a red mark, which you can think of as going from one to two and a blue mark going from two to one. This guy is actually carrying two marks, both of which are blue, uh, one going from three to one, the other going from one to three. And each vertex also carries a mark. The mark is uh, in this case, either red or blue. So the, there's a finite set of edge marks, a finite set of vertex marks, and the mark of the edge between V and W in the direction towards W is denoted by Xi sub G V W. The mark of the vertex V is denoted by tau sub G of V. Now, suppose you're given uh, two adjacent vertices in this graph. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, think about the edge mark of this edge u v in the direction from u to v. And then we are going to think of removing this edge between u and v, looking at what is left of the graph, g prime, and think of it as rooted at v. And we're going to take the pair of these two objects. Now, we're also going to consider equivalence classes of this pair. So we're going to replace the actual g prime v by its equivalence class up to rooted isomorphism. So this is now going to give us a member of, uh, so that this is like a mark, so it's from the mark set. This is drawn from the equivalence classes of rooted marked graphs, marked in this general sense. So we call that set G star with a bar on top of it to remind us that we are marking, we are putting marks. And if you're only interested in this object up to depth H, then we, we truncate to H. So that, that set of uh, rooted marked graphs uh, up to depth H, rooted isomorphism class of rooted mark graphs of depth H is denoted like this. So we do this. Now this is done in the direction V. So of course you might think, why aren't I, why am I not doing that in the direction U? And indeed I'm going to do it in the direction U also, but just to illustrate it through an example, here is a, here is a marked graph in my sense. So the roots, are, the vertices are marked with either blue or red. The edges have got either blue or orange marks, but each edge has got a double mark, one in each direction. So uh, to define this thing called G13, you're going to basically think about the mark in the direction three uh, of the edge one three. So that happens to be this orange guy, it's pointed in the direction three. And then I remove the edge one three and I look at the rest of the graph. Uh, so the three to five, two, four, going back to one, but the one three has been removed. Uh, and I think of that as rooted at three. So that's G13. And if I was interested in it's only up to depth two, then I will only go up to depth two from the root three. So that's just to illustrate the construction. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do this not only in the UV direction, but also in the VU direction. And we're going to think of the pair of those two objects. So each of them as an element of this set. Uh, and uh, for any given depth H, we're going to go up to depth H minus one for these two objects. And we call this pair the depth H type of the edge. So here is a graph which has got uh, double-sided edge marks, even though they all look one-sided. They, they think of them as double-sided because they happen to be the same in both sides and uh, vertex marks. And uh, essentially the depth for H equal to two, you'll be looking at depth one for these objects. And uh, this picture shows basically what those objects are for every one of the edges. Uh, there's obviously not enough time to verify this. Now, uh, for any given pair of elements, G and G prime of this kind, which are uh, you know parts of a type, we're going to do the following. For, for, for a rooted mark graph, rooted at the root O, we ask ourselves how many of its neighbors V have the property that the type, the type, the, uh, the uh, depth H type of the edge between O and V is this particular pair G, G prime. That number is called E sub H G, G prime of G, O. So here's an example. In this graph, the uh, E sub H for these two depth one objects with these partial markings, edge markings corresponding to this part is two, if one can check that. Now this unimodularity, unimodularity property basically uh, comes down to uh, requiring that the only property distributions of interest are the admissible ones, which are ones where uh, for any pair G, G prime, the expected number 
uh, the expectation of this EHGG prime under the property distribution P, where P is some property distribution on graphs, rooted graphs of depth H, is the same when you flip G and G prime. So this is a condition on probability distributions on depth H rooted mark graphs. So a P either has this property or it doesn't. Uh, every unimodular distribution has uh, has uh, has its depth H truncation admissible for every depth H. So how do you now construct a, a, a unimodular Galton Watson tree? You start with a property distribution on uh, trees, and then you want to extend it. So to extend it, you need a construction. So if you have two trees, uh, two elements which are you know with sort of like a half half marked edge sticking out and uh, and a rooted tree call them T and T prime. What you do is you, you take the, the um, uh, you take the, um, uh, you take the T guy. So you want to construct something rooted at O. You take the T guy and you think of him as hanging off as a subtree of O. And then you think of the root O as having an extra offspring V and on V, you hang out T prime. And then on the edge from O to V, you use these two partial marks to figure out what the two-sided mark is on that edge. So this guy is basically hanging off here. There's another guy V, and then the other guy hangs off here. So this is a construction to, uh, that you can do with two trees to create another tree rooted at one at this location. So now we construct, given a property distribution that is admissible on a uh, rooted, marked trees to depth H, we construct a probability distribution on rooted marked trees to arbitrary depth, which is analogous to what we did earlier with the unimodular Galton Watson tree. This is a generalization of it. So first we pick uh, a sample to depth H from this distribution rooted at some O. And then we have to figure out how to extend it. So uh, what we do is uh, for each vertex V, which is connected to O, we look at now, this is now some depth H minus one thing, which is uh, a piece of what we constructed earlier. And we look at the at the depth H minus one part that sits at the root at the root O. And we figure out how to extend this T to T tilde according to a rule that is basically based on renewal theory. So this is the formula that one uses. So you look at all the different ways in which T prime together with T could have created a T tilde together with T prime could have created something consistent with T, and you have to reweight according to that consistency. So that's where this formula comes from. So uh, based on that formula, you sample uh, from T tilde according to that distribution, and that's how you extend this. You do that for every V that hangs off O, and you keep constructing the tree. So that's basically the construction of the unimodular Galton Watson tree in the colored case. Now I have only a few minutes left, so let me now come to the punchline. So uh, in our example, uh, which is of, you know, this, um, we've got some big graph and uh, each graph has got a server, which is operating at rate one, a buffer of si which has got size K and an arrival process, which is Poisson. And you've got this dynamic where uh, if you are, if a, a customer, if a arrival comes to a full buffer, it gets to pick one of the neighbors of that node at random and look for room there. So first of all, we can think of the underlying graph as being a marked graph by thinking of uh, Poisson processes as marks at each node. And the Poisson processes we use are basically virtual processes. So there's a virtual external arrival process, Poisson process rate lambda, which is the times at which arrivals potentially occur. There's a virtual service process of rate one, which is only going to be used if there is actually somebody sitting in the buffer. And there are virtual processes, there's a virtual process for testing the buffer at some other server. So that is uh, uh, occurring also at rate lambda. And it basically, uh, uh, you know, think of it as coming with an arrival, and it's checking whether the picky um, checking whether the um, uh, you can think of it basically as hanging off the arrivals if you like. It's only used if the buffer is full, and it's checking some other buffer at random to and uh, in the neighborhood and try and would go there if there was room at that buffer. So this is where you set it, set this up as a mark process for dynamics. If you want to think about the stationary situation, you can also think about the realization of the stationary distribution as marks. So this is how you can view our, uh, our situation, let's say in stationarity as a marked graph. And this is the modeling proposal to replace mean field limits. So suppose that the interactions are to depth H. 
So you pick some h bar, which is bigger than h, bigger than or equal to h. And you model the underlying large network as being a marked unimodular graph, unimodular Galton Watson tree, whose defining distribution is some unknown p, which is a property distribution on rooted trees up to this depth h bar. And based on these ansatz, you write fixed point equations to try to pin down p. So that's the suggestion. Now, as in the mean field case, such a fixed point equation may have multiple solutions, but nevertheless, it will give you some idea of the range of possibilities for performance quantities. Now, one problem is that in the mean field case, you actually do have a theorem that says that you do have fixed points because you can look at the specific mean field dynamic and we have a limit theorem for that, but there's no such theorem at this point in this context. So uh, to apply this ansatz, you, one way is you could try to find approximate solutions to the fixed point equations. So roughly satisfying the fixed point equations, or you can increase H bar to have more parameters with which to try to fit the distribution. So let's, uh, let me just illustrate that in our example in the last couple of minutes. So uh, I'm going to illustrate that assuming that we already have interactions to depth one only. So I'll just take H bar equal to one. And I'll also assume that the uh, underlying graph structure is uh, going to a limit, which is basically a line. In general, the empirical distribution of the depth uh, of the local structure might be more complicated, right? The graph was very complicated, but I'm just for illustrative purposes, just consider the case, not only that H bar is one, but where the underlying graph is a line. And also I'm going to just assume that capital K is one for illustrative purposes. How does one work out this, this procedure in that case? So in this case, the unknown probability distribution that we are trying to solve for basically has got six parameters because we have a depth one structure along a line and we have got capital K equal to one. So you can have you know, full buffer, full buffer, full buffer, or 110, one, zero, 100, zero, et cetera. So there are six possibilities. And the admissibility condition, it turns out, is basically uh, that B plus two S has to equal T plus two C. You can work that out. It's, uh, you can actually work that out without even knowing this theory by thinking about the line as being two-sided. Now the UGW2 extensions look like this. So suppose that, uh, that I'm at a root is one and I'm at a child, which is one. There's some other child, but I don't care about it. I want to know how to extend this child. So I'm going to extend it by one with this probability. I'm going to extend it by zero with this probability and so on for the other four, other three cases. So basically three possible cases, four cases in total because one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So this is going to give you basically the extension depth two and in general, a full extension. And now you can basically uh, attempt to solve for the A for the six parameters by looking at the dynamic because you've got a Markov chain now uh, at the level of triples where the rates are defined in terms of the stationary distribution. So you can attempt to solve for it. There's no guarantee a priori that you will have solutions that in which case you may have to look for approximate solutions or to increase the H. But in this case, you do have solutions for certain values of Lambda. And that actually suggests that there might be a theorem around, but the theorem has not yet been proved. But the point is, once you get these kinds of P, you're getting something that is mean field like, right? A fixed point solution, but it's much more cognizant of the nature of the actual graph. So it can be used as a practical tool to try to get insight into large networks. That was the point of this talk. So here's the concluding remarks. Uh, so performance analysis of large networks is very challenging. And so one needs a simple approaches to build crude models to develop some intuition. Mean field models are widely studied, but they have the problem that they don't keep track of the underlying locality of the interaction. So we are proposing based on this local weak limit theory, uh, another modeling technique, uh, which is to basically model using uh, marked unimodular Galton Watson trees. And uh, uh, you know, the, uh, one would hope that this gives uh, another toolbox, another element in the toolbox anyway, to address large networks. And I, the typo here, which I'll try to fix in the, in the actual talk. Uh, so uh, and that's it. And thank you very much. Here are a whole bunch of references, actually two pages of references. All these papers are related in some way to the things I talked about today. Uh, thank you very much.